before anything else, I like to make a, a personal um, remark. I'd like to warmly thank the organizers of this event uh, for the invitation to moderate, to be the moderator of this um, roundtable. I'd like to say that uh, I thought that this is quite appealing and I also found the title appealing, Ideas in Action to Change Europe. And this I say because it goes away from the policies context and it allows us uh, to reach the places where uh, thought is being produced. Uh, uh, we reach the think tanks, uh, which is really necessary for the entire Europe because we are in need of uh, concepts, ideas. I will uh, remind you of uh, the parallel in Godard's uh, film and the uh, young soldier. Uh, the time of action, the era of action has come to an end. So now we have the time, the era of thought that um, will Come. So it is really interesting uh, to hear the representatives of uh, many political institutes uh, concluding. I'd like to say that in the past few years in Greece, uh, an important work has been um, going on in this sector. There are excellent institutes that uh, are affiliated to political parties and some others that are independent. It has nothing to do with that. We have uh, excellent uh, work undertaken by the in Nikos Poulantas Institute. Uh, re just recently, I had uh, a, um, uh, attended uh, an event on inequalities. We have ISTAMI, the Andreas Papandreou Institute, uh, excellent work undertaken by the Institute of Andreas Karamalis. Uh, and um, the other laboratories of social democracy and uh, think tanks uh, that are around uh, the social and productive uh, bodies. So this is all I had to say. Thank you once again for the invitation. And now the participants uh, are in this panel are Mr. Costas Donizinas, um, um, Syriza MP, Professor of Law and Political Philosophy at Birkbeck uh, College in uh, the University of London, Mr. Walter Bayer, Political Coach coordinator of the Transform Europe Network, uh, Mr. Vendran Horvat, director of the Institute of Political Ecology from Croatia, Madam Irene Fontanelle, representative of uh, the Emin van der Wendel Institute of uh, the Belgian Socialist Party, and Yanis Milopoulos, professor at the Polytechnic School of uh, the University of Thessaloniki. Mr. Tuzinas has the floor. Thank you very much. Allow me, please, uh, first uh, to uh, speak standing. Unfortunately, the speaker cannot be heard. Please instruct the speaker to turn on the microphone because we can't hear them. We can't hear the speaker. The European Union celebrated its 60th birthday, but the birthday was overshadowed by a divorce, a deviant child, and a funeral. The divorce first. Divorce, of course, is Brexit. And of course, because I've lived in London for 40 years, returned only in 2015 when I was elected, it is a, an extremely traumatic event for me. I'm not going to say more. I should, however, just add that it's terribly important that we keep in contact with Corbyn's label, which is an extremely uh, major influence on the left in Europe. Second, the rise of the Divian child that was bred in the bosom of the European Union. Right-wing ethno-nationalism and neo-fascism have returned. Politics has gone mad uh, was the politicians and uh, mainstream commentators reaction. After Macron's victory, the complacent Europhiles declared the problem over. They were wrong. Austria, Germany, and the extreme right-wing participation in a number of other European uh, governments shows that the problem of right-wing Euroscepticism and even neo-fascism is here to stay. This rise, however, was predictable. 
the economic, political, and cultural change leading to Brexit, Trump, and the rest are similar and well known. Neoliberal capitalism needs open borders for capital, finance, and trade. The shrinking of the social state and the privatization of state assets. All these lead inexorably to structural unemployment and the huge increase of inequalities. What feeds capitalism eats away also at its foundations. The unraveling of the social state was facilitated by what is known in political philosophy as the post-democratic or the post-political condition. Complex social problems require optimal scientific solutions, we are told. They cannot be put into public deliberation and certainly not to the vote. Politics gives way to neoclassical economics. The center left and the center right converge into the extreme center with technocratic and grand coalition governments. Social democratic parties cannot compete on this ground with the authentic capitalists and have declined. The neologism, pasochisation, has entered the political lexicon all over Europe. Pasok, its inspirator, its Greek inspirator, is at this very moment trying to change its name for the third time in as many years. Understandably, citizens conclude that elections make no difference and turn away from politics. They derogate at retreatments. The business as usual mantra of the elites made it clear that elites are not interested in the ordinary people. They are selfish, corrupt, delinquent. But the question is this. Who will give the answer? Who will hegemonize the political response to justified popular anger. Radical democracy or right-wing populism? We are fighting in part on exactly the same terrain. Finally, the funeral. The funeral is the death of the aspiration of political integration of the European Union that was the raison d'etre of Brussels since the 1980s. It went through a number of phases. In the 1980s, neo-functionalist spillovers from already uh, integrated, um, uh, integrated fields to adjacent ones with the European Court of Justice playing a major role in what became known integration by stealth through the law. The next stage was, of course, the uh, possibility of creating a European constitution, and that came, unfortunately, to an end through the uh, constitutional uh, the constitutional referenda, which made it clear that citizens are not interested in further integration. The euro, the EMU, I would claim, is in part the answer to that difficulty created, that impasse after the constitution. It separated the integration process from the will of the people, and that, as Jürgen Habermas has said, the monetary union has developed into a non-transparent, post-democratic case of executive federalism. The AMU was presented as a technocratic exercise, but it soon morphed by stealth into a fiscal union and started pushing the 18 towards a federal entity without politics. The Euro crisis was and still is the final attempt at some kind of convergence, this time through diktat. The bailout programs impose fiscal and current account discipline, internal devaluation and reduction of the labor cost, aiming to turn the southern states into paid imitations of the northern export-based uh, export economic model. But the measures uh, that were supposed to help in this direction depressed further the much larger domestic sector and as a result, this experiment in social engineering, which is worthy of Jeremy Bentham and 19th century social, uh, social reformers, uh, has again come to a problem, uh, to, to a difficult position. So what is the answer at this minute to the existential crisis of Europe? The white paper, the human proposals, the emerging Franco-German axis, all tinker with the idea of Kern Europa, a core Europe either of the Eurozone or even a smaller group. The creation of an EMF to police fiscal discipline, the doubtful completion of the banking union, perhaps the creation of a minister for finance. All these things formalize the already existing variable geometry or multiple speed 
Europe. They entrench certain neoliberal positions by giving them a stronger legal foundation. The European elites seem to answer the chasm between their policies and the citizens by offering more of the same. We know what happened to David Cameron, to Hillary Clinton, and uh, Mr. Renzi, who followed the similar tactic of always business as usual. The failures of the elites have created a great opportunity for the left. We have the responsibility to articulate and represent both popular skepticism and a new project for the survival of Europe. We live in a double bind. The European political and institutional edifice is both non-viable in its current form and indispensable for Europe. The left can neither accept the current EU nor, nor return to old nationalism. The task is to rebuild Europe from the bottom up as a community of democratic nations and people as opposed to the current one size fits all top down contract. contract. The battle for the soul of Europe will take place in three, on three fronts. First, of course, a reversal of austerity and recession creating policies. Wide political alliances are necessary for such policies, and this forum is an excellent opportunity and a wonderful, I think, idea. Uh, because it brings people together to exchange ideas and adopt initiatives. Such, uh, in, in this direction, initiatives and ideas could include fiscal policies for growth, the guarantee of bank deposits, a topping tax, and perhaps eurobonds. Our second task, however, is to re-politicize politics. We must acknowledge the justified anger of citizens that has moved them towards political apathy and anti-systemic parties. We need a new radical democracy model. I would call it a left populism. Indeed, the Syriza manifesto in the elections back in 2015 and its victory was a perfect example of this idea. It combined a class element, anti-austerity policies. Second, an element of cultural patriotism, the idea of a popular sovereignty that is being imposed upon and undermined and limited by the IMF and the EU. And of course, that catches all the questions of cultural disenchantment that also uh, have a, a role to play in this idea of uh, populism. And then, of course, finally, the democratic. The third element was the democratic element with its two pillars the ballot paper and the street, formal politics and social movements. Populism, as a political strategy, fosters the creation of a popular subject. We, the people, through the use of those three pillars and the division with the other side. Now, when Syriza won and signed the third program, this strategy had to change. We have no left theory that we can adopt we can read it in a book, in a, in a textbook, in a recipe, adopt it, and then apply it here. We did not know what a left governmentality means or how to do left reform. And we had to do it. We were like people who go into the sea alone in order to learn how to swim. Only recently, a new clear dividing line is emerging through the attack on the monumental corruption and grand scale cronies of the ancient regime. Now, the European left, I believe, needs to learn from the Greek experience. We need to go back to our roots and re signify them. Our principles and our priorities should first be a kind of theoretical approach and understanding that we live in an age of the general intellect and immaterial labor that social reproduction is horizontal, networked and dispersed. Ideologies, policies, and party structures must match that recognition. Democracy, as a method of vote aggregation and representation, must be supplemented by democracy as a form of life, moving from politics to economics, society, culture, and the everyday life. So my proposals in terms of the European uh, and here I finish in terms of the European 
front, as it were, and uh, the parties of the left and the center left, is that we need a major public debate on this refoundation of Europe. Macron's plan includes such a debate, something similar, but I think it is unlikely to happen at that level. Therefore, we must adopt it and start a wide public consultation with parties, movements, and people. Through this process, I think we should start drafting a new EU constitution for the 21st uh, century and eventually ask for a constituent assembly. The consultation and constitution must place the well-being of citizens at the center plan an alternative people-centered globalization. Second, we must reboot our institutions. The powers of European, of national and local uh, parliaments must m uh, increase uh, in relation vis-a-vis -vis the executive branch. Uh, direct democracy, institutions such as local referenda and citizen assemblies, collective budgets should also be introduced. The initiatives for a pan-European debate and assembly will reconnect us, because this is the big question for me, with those people who have been seduced by right-wing populism. This is our major task, to direct justified popular anger at impoverishment, abandonment, humiliation by the elite, away from nationalist exclusion and discrimination, and to towards social justice and inclusion. We must align with the movements and campaigns of resistance, of solidarity, of social economy. And the public debate and perhaps a constituent assembly will have a key role in achieving this. A European campaign to welcome and integrate refugees and immigrants is important. I believe that the next enlargement of the European Union should be an enlargement of people, of refugees and immigrants, because those are the people who will contribute, as so many immigrant waves in the past, to the renewal of an old and tired continent. Europe, and here I'm finishing, has failed to create a demos or a working democracy. The Union was unable, despite half-hearted attempts, to, gener to generate a sense that Europeans belong to a common cultural, political, and economic space. The daily experience of the vast majority of uh, European citizens is one of political, cultural, and emotional attachment to the local, the regional, and the national. This means that perhaps we should develop a new type of federation that does not and cannot abolish the nation, nor does it replace the demos, but transforms their significance by replacing exclusionary sovereignty by a new type of shared sovereignty. It is perhaps the duty of the left and the victorious Greek left in particular with its institutional naivete and youthful audacity to think through these major changes. We have the historic duty to save Europe by changing it and I think this meeting today and similar meetings in the past are the very important first step in this direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vuzinas. Now I'd like to ask Mr. Walter Bayer to take the floor. First of all, thank you very much for having invited me to this uh, important exchange of ideas taking place uh, in a crucial moment of uh, European history. Uh, the crisis <coughs> of uh, European integration seems to be the expression of something uh, much deeper, namely uh, the crisis of the way of governing the European societies, maybe even the crisis of liberal democracy triggered through the neoliberal turn in the 90s and the policies applied uh, after 2008. And we should expect the tensions and contradictions not to diminish but to rise in the forthcoming period. There is much discussion about the difficulties of the United Kingdom's government to agree on a coherent strategy uh, in the negotiations with the European Union.
but much less attention is paid to contradictions amongst the EU member states. A couple of weeks ago, I came across an article in demonstrating that the money transfer to the home country uh, from Polish citizens living in the United Kingdom amounts to 23 billion euro, which is about 1.5% of the GDP uh, of Poland. In Slovakia, uh, the transfers amount to 3% and in Latvia, even to 6%. These are only examples. We could, of course, also speak about the German automotive industry with its more than 100 production sites and subcontractors in the United Kingdom. About, DM, uh, about the BMW um, uh, firm, which exports 250,000 cars per year uh, to the United Kingdom. Many commentators say, and even the EU Commission uh, is convinced of, that in 2017 elections, the onslaught of far-right parties to governmental power could be warded off. Although, through the high price, which is the fading of social democracy as a decisive force in a number of countries. This is true for the presidential elections in Austria, in France, the parliamentary elections in the Netherlands and in Czechia, where in the latter country a far-right party scored offhand 15%, and it's of course true in Italy, as Marco Rivelli demonstrated uh, yesterday. We see growing difficulties in forming stable governments, which would allow for a while the continuation of neoliberal policies though with a new rhetoric. However, uh, whether governments, if they are constituted like the German government, are sustainable is questionable, especially if the EU's economies, e economies turned down again, which can easily happen. Moreover, we see a rise of nationalism across the European Union. Catalonia, Macedonia, UK, Slovenia, Croatia, Hungary, Latvia, and you name it. So what about the radical left? The electoral cycle 2017, uh, including the Italian elections, um, brought for the radical left uh, a number of votes uh, of 10 million point five, of 10.5 uh, millions, um, in comparison of 8.6 million in the last cycle, which is an increase of 20%. In total, we could summarize that the radical left disposes over a considerable electoral power and even managed to increase its numbers of votes by almost 20%. On the other hand, one could argue, the parties in question differ in many respects. Maybe they all, or in fact, they all agree in the objection of austerity policies, but differ in the way how they perceive the European Union and the strategy which they prefer uh, to apply uh, for the European integration. Some comrades conclude that we will see at the forthcoming European elections competing party foundation formations contending uh, uh, in the, uh, on the left. However, after the voting down of the transnationalists in the European Parliament, it will not be easy to form a new political force outside or in opposition to the European left, for both legal and political reasons. The European left party, with all its difficulties and flaws, therefore will most probably remain the key factor within the left on the European level. However, it is evident that things have to change structurally and political, politically. And there are possibilities to achieve uh, new alliances. The crucial question, however, is if we will see more or less unity on the left. I hold that this is a question of politics and a question of leadership. Considering the complicated conditions, we should strive for a variable geometry of the unity in the left. We will see parties, may they belong to the L or not, issuing joint declarations, staging joint events in the campaign for the forthcoming European elections. We will see countries in which the M25 will present itself alone or in alliance with other parties, maybe even uh, such which belong to the European left. 
in my opinion, there is nothing wrong about a variable geometry under the condition it is based on a creative synthesis of ideas. How can we achieve uh, unity? The question is rather whether or not our parties and the left prove able to understand the challenge that they have to cope with. This has become crystal clear through the rise of the radical right parties during the last electoral cycle. I was already referring uh, to uh, the scores of the radical left. Uh, this uh, concerns the Netherlands, France, Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic and Hungary. The parties of the radical right scored in this last electoral cycle 12 million votes in comparison to, five, uh, to, to 6 million votes in the last uh, electoral cycle. That means that the radical right in, uh, uh, sorry, I, I was mistaken, the radical right scored 18, 18 million votes, including the result of the Italian elections, in comparison to 6 uh, million uh, at the, in, during the last electoral cycle. That means that the radical right in 2017 uh, and 2018 tripled its number of votes uh, and thereby uh, overtakes the radical left party. There is also a qualitative component to be recognized. In 2017, within Europe's radical right, an important clarification process uh, took place. Now, partially as a result of Brexit, the two competing parliamentary groups on the far right, essentially made up of British parties, European conservatives and reformists, and a Europe of freedom and direct democra democracy will disappear after the next uh, European elections, with the consequence that the political initiative will pass to the group of Europe of nations and freedom, led by the Front National, the FPÖ, the Lega Nord, uh, the Belgian um, Flams Belang, and the Netherlands uh, PVV respectively to its corresponding European-wide party, Movement for a Europe of Nation and Freedom. In identical documents, and I emphasize in identical documents, uh, the political party on the European level of the far right and the parliamentary group uh, set out their principles and I quote, the parties and the individual members uh, of the ENF group based their political alliance on the sovereignty of states and their citizens, relying on the cooperation between nations and therefore reject any policy designed to create a supranational state or a supranational model. The opposition to any transfer of national sovereignty to supranational bodies and or European institutions is one of the fundamental principles uniting the members of the ENF. They base their political alliance on the preservation of the identity of the citizens and nations of Europe in accordance with their specific characteristics of each population. The right to control and to regulate immigration is thus a fundamental principle shared by all members of the ENF group. This is their charter of principle, not more than this, 25 lines only. And this is a clear message. And it cannot be excluded that we will see in the next European Parliament a parliamentary group of the radical right with, the, with uh, a strength, eye level, with the Social Democrats and the Conservatives. I think that this constitutes the veritable political challenge towards which our European left has to be measured. We cannot cope with this by adding simply forces which exist. We have to refer to the social movements and we have to come up with a coherent political and strategic idea. I would like to propose that the left presents itself with a very slim program encompassing uh, a number of straightforward cornerstones. A a plan for a social, economic and ecological recovery, addressing in the first place the interests and the needs of the young generation, coping with youth unemployment and precariousness. B, opposition against the militaristic turn of the European integration, discernible in the recent decisions. 
C, a clear pronouncement in favor of an enhanced cooperation of the left in the European South and in other regions of the European Union. D, solidarity with the ref uh, refugees, migrants, and the full recognition of the citizens' rights of EU citizens living and working in other member states. And E, putting center stage the call for a radical democratization of the European Union based on the respect of national self-determination of its states and nations and on a true transnational democracy. The core, and this would be E, uh, would be F, the core of transnational democracy is the empowerment of the elected bodies on all level and of the European Parliament vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the non-elected bureaucracies and technocracies. It must be the European Parliament which obtains the full control over the European Commission and the right to guide the European uh, Central Bank. To formulate such a platform on a broad basis must be possible. How can the left express its existence as a transnational form because, uh, 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 beyond an electoral platform? Why not presenting candidates from other countries on the national party lists uh, in different countries? It, it, uh, for example, a Greek uh, in Austria, a German in France, and so on and so forth. However, the core issue will be if there will be a candidate of the alternative left presented for the presidency of the European Commission. Having nominated Alexis Tsipras, the then opposition leader in the Greek parliament, has provided the left campaign uh, not only with a common character, but also has much contributed to its political impact. Presenting a common candidate for the European Commission, in my opinion, is the duty of any serious contender at the European elections. Moreover, as we can not take for granted that the European uh, Council, again, will agree to the arrangement which prevailed uh, at the last European elections. But even more importantly than this is, Given the strength and the extent of political co coherence of the radical nationalist right, it would be disastrous for the left if in the public debate before the European elections, the radical nationalist right would appear as the only challenger of the established parties and the grand coalition in the European Parliament. And this particularly goes for the European-wide televised debates of the top uh, candidates. Let me wind up uh, in saying, I believe that there is a huge responsibility put on the European left. There is a huge danger uh, over Europe, but at the same time, there are big possibilities and we ought to take them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Bayer. Now I'd like to call upon uh, Mr. Vendran Horvath to take the floor. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, again, uh, also I would like to thank you uh, for invitation. I'm happy that I can contribute to, to these discussions. First of all, I would like to start with uh, the notion uh, on the uh, failure of European integration. The, that is a, some sort of uh, broader framework to, to understand some of the components uh, for the potentially new, new narrative and the new story for the uh, green and left uh, political actors. I will depart from Eastern Europe where in the last years we see some sort of uh, constant uh, permanent uh, move to so-called illiberal order, uh, which I see as a very dangerous response to, uh, to some sort of very superficial transformation that has taken pl uh, place in the last 30 years since the fall of Berlin Wall. Uh, merely it was, of course, we know, reduced to uh, transition to so-called market economy, 
but the deeper uh, democratization of these countries have been, uh, have been mainly absent. Uh, and in this case, uh, the liberal values like uh, rule of law, human rights, and so, have been mainly uh, there to justify uh, some, sort of, uh, some sort of plunder in some cases. So we see another fracture in the EU uh, through this uh, division uh, between Western and Eastern Europe uh, where in the later case of Eastern Europe we also see very strong neoconservative tendencies and very strong inclination to adapt uh, authoritarian rule, uh, particularly by the right political forces. Moreover, uh, the most recent findings uh, not only by Piketty, but also by uh, authors like Milanovic and Novokmet, uh, show uh, a large discrepancy in the benefits from the European integration between West and East, uh, in which case uh, Eastern Europe uh, is apparently uh, uh, on the loser side, where uh, the uh, capital transfers have been uh, taking place between do these two regions of the EU, uh, there is obvious discontent on the Eastern European side uh, for its status and uh, the privileged uh, uh, conditions. Uh, so I would like to say that this actually is uh, giving some material, some fuel for discontent. And uh, this discontent uh, uh, has not been met by any of the left or green uh, or other progressive political forces, but unfortunately by by the right uh, political forces in Eastern Europe. Last but not least on this topic, uh, I would like to, relating to the, any discussion on the, on the transformation of the EU and the arranging multi-speed, multiple split Europe, uh, we should of course uh, think of uh, contributing with a story that does not uh, uh, make a view from European periphery any different uh, from the view from European Center. And uh, I think that any, any sort of uh, coherent political program uh, on the left or green or progressive side should take into account that this proximity or actually this distance should be uh, decreased if we talk about the future of Europe. Secondly, the increase of the uh, authoritarian or uh, ultra-right answers to to the crisis which was experienced in the EU, and particularly uh, as we witness in the eastern part of Europe, so-called neoconservative revolutions, uh, we see that uh, this doesn't always take place as a contestation uh, against the uh, neoliberal order, neoliberal economic order, even in cases where there is some sort of state protectionism, there is still uh, the players actually play the game. Uh, with the uh, uh, neoliberal actors, but there is a obviously uh, relevant division to contesta contesting uh, liberal values. So there is this clear division that uh, contestation goes again, uh, again more identity into direction of identity politics rather than uh, rather than uh, substantially challenging uh, neoliberal economic order in I in this part of Europe. So what uh, it is the challenge for uh, this political spectrum to find uh, another story and another language that would actually be uh, uh, sufficiently powerful to substitute the language or of uh, fear and exclusion that is generated by, by the uh, right uh, political forces in Eastern Europe. Uh, of course, we uh, uh, across Europe we can find in the recent years some positive political projects, uh, particularly related to municipalist political projects at the local level, which uh, literally offer politics of friendship, politics of hope, or even politics of love, like in case of Barcelona. So uh, I just want to very big explicit on that, that the language of the uh, alternative political program, alternative to the currently uh, uh, threatening uh, discourse of the, of the right wing, uh, has to uh, embody uh, different values and different sentiments, uh, uh, rather than uh, taking part 
uh, taking part in the in the language of exclusion and uh, hate. <coughs> so therefore, uh, I think that for both for the left and the, for the greens, the main, one of the main challenges is to be able to talk to majority. I think that this capacity has been, if if it was e ever achieved uh, in some episodes in, of history. Now it is very much uh, weak, uh, and so I, it is not only about talking and addressing the concerns and issues of your, let's say, more or less natural constituencies uh, of 5, 10, 15 percent in most of the cases across Europe, but to be able to, uh, to actually talk to majority of the people, particularly departing from the uh, recognition that economic crisis and ecological crisis are very much uh, the same crisis of the system and that they relate to all the people. So all the people will be affected by the deep ecological crisis uh, that we are not yet aware fully in the EU uh, and we are in a, in a way uh, living to, to the rest of the world some sort of privileged life. So the main question that should be also addressed by any um, uh, new program would be that uh, to see how Europe actually can continue with uh, more or less decent uh, uh, life for all its citizens uh, in the global context, which is more and more challenging, and how uh, it can reduce the amount, number of people who would be reduced, who would be excluded from this access to, let's say, good life. So uh, it is the, the main, main challenge I see for the program is to, uh, is to find out uh, the ways how uh, Europe can maintain more or less its uh, current status uh, in economic sense uh, without uh, burdening uh, nature or people uh, even more. So it is, uh, it is about uh, bringing a, a new politics that would actually balance uh, the triangle between life, <coughs> human life, nature and capital, uh, and uh, would not actually, uh, uh, would not actually uh <coughs> risk any of these uh, uh, three pillars uh, as uh, you know, sacrificing them. So for the la uh, some last thoughts on how actually uh, progressive forces, including Greens and Left, can reinvent, reinvent their uh, program and uh, uh, reposition themselves, which I think is necessary, is, uh, <coughs> is actually not uh, to be uh, reduced to be uh, only a voice of periphery, Periphery, not only in geographical sense, but periphery in a sense of any sort of divisions related to class, to region, region center, center periphery in the geographical sense, but also rural, urban, gender, class, even race in some European countries. So uh, in this case, I, I would say that uh, uh, this uh, the urge to talk to majority should be kind of combined with, with uh, also ambition to talk both to center and to periphery uh, in 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 in, uh, li in literal sense. So uh, I also think that it is very important to identify common ground uh, of the in convergence space between uh, these forces. Uh, of course, there are many open issues that. Uh, to some extent can be relevant for internal discussions, particularly, I don't know, on productivism or extractivism, particularly in the economic field. But uh, I would say that in this moment, it, is, uh, it would be a kind of a very much a, a wasting of time to invest uh, in the light of, I don't know, European Parliament elections. It would be really a waste of time to invest into these discussions. These discussions can be uh, 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 we can be aware of them and we, they are anyhow very much uh, uh, related to l long term uh, uh, horizon so uh, we should of course uh, have to see who is actually benefiting from uh, who does benefit from 
this artificial conflict on the on the left spectrum, which I, I personally see more or less artificial. Uh, so uh, that that's why the uh, um, ambition would be to to look for the convergences. Uh, and thirdly, as that was already been said, uh, I, I think that uh, as for the left and for the greens, there have been always these two legs uh, of the walk. One leg was uh, if they were successful enough in the institutional field, in the in the parliamentary field, or even in an executive in institutions. And second one was always on the street, in the on the uh, in the movements, in the initiatives. And I think that recently. This second leg, which was uh, supposed to be on the street, uh, it has been lagging behind. Uh, it, it, it was much weaker leg, and uh, I think that it is, uh, it is uh, not imperative, but it is just the inevitable, uh, inevitable perspective to address uh, the relevance of the political thought and the political program of the of these political forces to check it on the street, because the street is where actually the right is winning currently in many of the countries. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, I think that this program should be highly disruptive related to uh, generally economic order that relates to uh, at the European level, but it should not be uh, again disruptive to each other. So. Uh, let's try to find the ways uh, in which we, our political activities uh, uh, on this spectrum are not uh, disruptive uh, one to each other and to, uh, to find a, what's called some sort of change, change, game changer uh, with, with two points. I would like to end up with this. I think that it is very important that we uh, find out uh, a chance and opportunity for the synergies and for convergences in, in creating new story and in uh, actually uh, finding a framework for cooperation, at least cooperation that would uh, avoid uh, any devastating impact uh, that, uh, the, that the development in the European politics would have after EP elections in 2019. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Venton Hovert, our Director of uh, Political Ecology Institute of Croatia. I'd like to ask Ms. Ariane Fontenelle, uh, representative of the Emil uh, van der Velde Socialist party Belgium uh, to take the floor. She's the only lady on the panel. In fact, we should have started with her. Well, if you would allow me, I will capitalize on the opportunity of interpretation and make the presentation in French. Thank you very much for inviting me to this beautiful city of Athens. There are two questions that we would like to elaborate on today the identity crisis and the defeat, the electoral defeat of uh, social democrats in Europe. The condition of social democrats in uh, Europe is alarming. The results and the outcomes of uh, the elections are quite sad, in fact. The right has uh, won uh, the majority in Europe, the overwhelming majority, and there is an unbridled neoliberalism, unbridled neoliberalism evolving even further. How is this uh, situation evolving with, uh, or has evolved with Reagan in the US, Thatcher in England? in the 70s and 80s, respectively. We had a setback, we had a regression. Furthermore, the neoliberal wave uh, became ever more enhanced, proposing a vision of the society which regards profit maximization and the deregulation of the market. This phenomenon has uh, become ever more intense today, and it affects all income brackets and social strata on the level of financial initiatives, 
social protection. In effect, the state has lost the role of uh, the protector of citizens. And of course, we have the phenomenon of financial globalization that evolved very fast and it became a reality for the entire planet within very few years. However, it was not uh, put in the framework it should have been put in. Of course, we have ecology problems which in effect never constituted uh, um, a domain regulated suitably and we suffer the consequences in uh, countries that are least developed and many millions of uh, citizens have been rejected to poverty, abject poverty, have been reduced to abject poverty. Of course, socialist parties are also victims of this whole state of affairs and as a result, these parties have grown more introverted. Until the advent of the neoliberal wave of affairs, there were certain certainties. There were calm relations between employers and employees. There used to be a social security and neither of these is in fact guaranteed or can be guaranteed today after the Second World War and the European austerity period, things became ever worse. Socialist parties are regarded by people as uh, incapable of protecting them at times of crisis and recession, which is not fair. I shall speak to you about my party, the socialist French-speaking party of uh, Belgium. I shan't tie you by referring to the multiplicity of her election system. In summary, this obliges us uh, to have alliances. However, we, we have always had an, a certain idea, a fixed idea. We have always wanted to protect social security, not to have a spontaneous uh, adaptation of uh, salaries to price index fluctuations and to have a certain age for retirement of people. This means that we have always been against the European idea of the semester. The parties of the right, uh, on the contrary, wanted very fast to do all the things we had been refusing to do because they wanted to act like the good guys of the European Union. And when we had the elections of the year 2014, we did very well. However, the right there joined forces with the neoliberal uh, Flemish speaking uh, parties in order to win in terms of votes. Why is it that I'd like to speak to you about our own political issues? Because I think that they constitute a notable case in point. Some parties reached the point of defending austerity policies that the European uh, Union wanted to establish. And of course, we have also had uh, extreme parties, nationalistic parties, and so on and so forth, that uh, met a rise in their history. I think that the time is ripe for social democracy of Europe to reformulate and to corroborate our principles, to define a policy which is clear cut and left, to process a solution vis-a-vis -vis the conservative right and to show people what left in Europe means. This is the only way to put an end to neoliberalism. As we see with the Costa uh, government and the Corbyn uh, government in the United Kingdom, we need to recruit uh, young people and to be supported by them in order to enhance solidarity. Portugal and Lisbon in particular uh, 
have shown us as an example that there are no further salary catbacks. So the years of austerity are officially over. The Costa Party has shown that all that Europe proclaims is no longer functional. This is a very interesting example for social democracy in Europe. And I think that there is an engagé left, uh, many people, grassroots, who are quite enthusiastic. And this is used as an example for the United States, where people seek an alternative. Angela Merkel was the star of austerity, the protagonist of austerity that uh, created the conditions of such poverty and misery in Europe. Uh, indeed, peoples were pushed to the limit in Greece, in Portugal and Spain. In the future, no people must fall prey to austerity or be hostages of austerity, no matter, no matter where this austerity is established. However, today um, in Europe there have been uh, a lot of uh, problems among employees. So, there are problems that regard um, attention and a rivalry um, among European member states. And this is an artificial tension because the aim is to further reduce uh, salaries. We want an open uh, economy on a European scale, but not to the detriment of uh, working people and to their demise. We want sustainable growth and development, and of course, we want to fight against climatic change and ecological disaster on the planet. Paul Manet in uh, Vallon uh, found himself at the forefront of the struggle. And he fought so that there can be commercial agreements signed between uh, the European uh, Union and Canada. Belgium has already asked the European uh, Court to provide an answer vis-à-vis -vis issues of exploitation by multinational companies. and. There is the ECMEA case that concerns uh, the protection of uh, investments, the ESDS, as we call it uh, in English, is not compatible with the articles of the European Treaty, uh, that is a treaty for the function of uh, the European Union, the FTU. We have fought battles uh, in order to change the CETA agreement. And these battles have shown that we do have strength and that we do have power, and they constitute an example of action that can be propagated throughout Europe. We also have the Singapore agreement that the European uh, Court of Justice has been uh, examining showing that this kind of action can lead to change. Socialists should also take initiative regarding technological change and progress because on them the entire framework of social protection can be based. For all intents and purposes, we should know that social protection and uh, progress cannot fall from the skies as if they were manna sent from God if we do not do something about it. There are risks for a great part of the population, not only on the level of employment and occupation, but also in what concerns ecology, in what concerns climatic change. 
we have uh, taken action in order to tackle this challenge as well. And we think that the management of climatic change phenomena and the political change phenomena uh, should be employed at the same time. So this is an aspiration that we have today. In fact, we have a triple aspiration regarding ecology, fair allocation of resources, raw materials and natural resources, that is, and citizen prosperity. The 1,000 billion uh, euros for the climate, for the planet, uh, of course, this is a symbolic sum. However, it is something which can truly attract attention in the sense of saving on energy, in the sense of using alternative uh, energy sources, both in an urban environment and an industrial setting. And this is uh, something that is to the benefit of people, men, women, uh, immigrants, refugees, for the protection of basic fundamental rights without any concession whatsoever. Hearing the previous speakers, I could say that we need to listen carefully to the left after the European elections for an alliance which could change things and lead us towards a truly socialist Europe. Institutions must be more transparent. The Eurogroup cannot be informal and that cannot be tolerance towards the continuous uh, lack of transparency we have today. And the European Parliament must have a say in the appointments made by the European Commission, appointments of people and positions, that is. So these are the different pillars on which we can exhibit solidarity in order to be able to tackle these phenomena that are deplorable in Europe. Uh, our speaker, Yanis Melopoulos, professor at the Polytechnic School of the Arras, Italian University of Thessaloniki. Thank you very much. Um, talking about uh, concepts and actions uh, to transform and change Europe, I'll try to refer to the core of the prevailing and predominant uh, concepts uh, that uh, shape today's political confrontation in Europe, because I believe that if we are to change something, we need first to get a very good grasp of it. We need to understand it and not only conquer it, uh, but also um, understand how it works. Um, so undoubtedly, the predominant ideological uh, field, uh, the ideology that is uh, and hegemony in Europe nowadays is um, economic neoliberalism. And around it, we have uh, everything that has to do with economy, uh, society, social Europe, inequalities, disparities, ecology, environmental balance, um, disruption and the sustainability of uh, the present uh, eco growth model, as well as uh, the subjects pertaining to institutions and democracy, the subjects pertaining to democratic Europe. The key, if one uh, needs to understand what's going on in Europe and on the globe vis-a-vis uh, -vis society, ecology, institutions and democracy, the key to it is the predominant uh, economic and growth uh, model, which is economic neoliberalization, neoliberalism. So let us see the traces, the footprint of this model that has been implemented after the Berlin Wall fell in Europe and which has been seen and felt here in Greece in the past eight to nine years as a result of this unbelievable austerity policy that vindictively 
has been imposed by the neoliberals of Europe in Greece, seeing Greece as a test bed. So, uh, considering international surveys, um, the surveys and studies that have not been conducted uh, by uh, only the left, but by valid, uh, acknowledged uh, uh, institutions and um, uh, foundations. So, considering uh, the um, Oxfam organization um, uh, report uh, uh, that was um, introduced in Davos in 2017, we see that um, the uh, wealth of uh, only eight uh, people in the world equals uh, the wealth of uh, the poorest half of the population of the Earth. That uh, corresponds to 3.6 billion inhabitants. Um, uh, Credit Suisse, which is a Swiss uh, banking institution, which is, of course, not um, a member of the left, uh, nor does it uh, doubt about uh, the predominant uh, neoliberal model, indicates that in the past few years, 1% of the global population has accumulated half of the globe's wealth, 50% that is, of the uh, wealth of the globe. One percent of the international world population and this invisible oligarchy has accumulated in its hands the um, uh, fifth, uh, the uh, fifty percent of the wealth, uh, and um, we now have uh, for the rest of the world population available nine, uh, th only thirteen percent of the global wealth. Uh, the uh, data on Greece uh, show even greater disparities. Disparities. One percent of uh, the population of Greece has increased its wealth um, during the globalization years by ten units. Uh, uh, that is, um, although 1%, uh, that is the wealthy of Greece, had uh, only 46% uh, of the wealth, nowadays they, they, have, they hold 56% of the wealth, which means that um, when we uh, all uh, are afflicted by the impact of an incredible austerity, um, pauperization of the lands, etc., a few uh, people People have increased their wealth in Greece. So this is the footprint of the economic neoliberalism, which needs to be seen as such, as depicted by the instruments and tools of economic neoliberalism per se, banking institutions, international organizations, etc. So this all has to do with the purely economic and social field, where we see that the trace and footprint of neoliberalism is an unbelievable, uh, ruthless um, disparity over, all over the globe and uh, in our country. But it is not only that. We see today that uh, if the aggressive growth model that has been introduced and imposed through international uh, competition, international markets, uh, by this um, neoliberal model, uh, the globalized neoliberal model, if the objective of this model was to, uh, for it to raise the level uh, of uh, all of the people, as was the initial promise, that was the social uh, proposal for this model. Having a more aggressive growth model, we will liberate uh, the markets. Everyone will have access to them. And through this aggressive financial economic competition, we will have a rise of the economic levels of the state. So if this is the prerequisite, in order for this to happen, we find that it would take three planets, three Earths, to give us the uh, necessary atmosphere, air, water, sea, soil, natural resources, energy resources to give what growth needs if it is to be uh, maintained and preserved. So we see that the neoliberal economic model is not only controlled 
socially. There is no legitimization vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis the ecology footprint. Uh, Mr. Tsironis also mentioned it yesterday. This growth is a non sustainable growth. It is a growth that uh, is only addressed uh, to the few because uh, the global ecosystem can't take it anymore, can't afford such a growth. The climate change is the most uh, uh, significant proof or evidence of the fact that the global climate, the world climate, something that we took for granted as a stable factor in the mid-term, and I'm not talking about the big climate changes uh, that were due to um, glasses or floods uh, as a result of geological changes that uh, took place in the planet, we would consider that uh, the climate, uh, at least at the, the level of uh, the civil engineer um, projects that were planned, uh, etc would have a cycle of 50 to 100 years, which would mean that things wouldn't change that radically. However, nowadays we find out that um, on a uh, yearly basis, the climate changes. We find out that there is global warming, and these are findings. They are not uh, hypotheses, nor is it um, the obsession of uh, um, certain minds. So it has been documented Thus, this shows that uh, this neoliberal growth, uh, not only did it cause um, huge social disparities, uh, but also threatens uh, the base uh, the basis, the foundations of this growth, uh, that is the ecosystem, the energy resources, the environment. So um, this neoliberal uh, uh, aggressive um, growth is something that the planet itself cannot afford. So this is a, some kind of growth uh, which we know by experience that uh, is not uh, tangible, it's not feasible, it's not sustainable. So we can claim here that the neoliberal growth is problematic, both socially speaking as well as ecologically speaking. It doesn't have the necessary legitimization socially and uh, ecologically, but I will be able to demonstrate that um, there is lack of democratic legitimization also. This is the most significant, uh, I believe, uh, of um, a lack, but, but uh, I, I believe that uh, the ecological um, uh, lack of uh, legitimization is also important, but what is uh, also important is the lack of democratic legitimization. The over-concentration, the excess concentration of the wealth uh, by an invisible uh, oligarchy, because we refer to funds. In the past, we would use to say, um, we, we, were, we would used to say, to talk about companies and names, etc. But nowadays, we are talking about funds, banking institutions, etc., behind which there are other people who are invisible. So this uh, over-concentration and accumulation of wealth by an invisible oligarchy uh, was not uh, only the result of the fact that some people gathered all the wealth, but they gathered also the entire, uh, all, all the power in the planet. Great decisions, uh, important decisions on the planet are not made by the states uh, through their democratically elected governments, but rather by those who are uh, powerful enough uh, to uh, increase uh, or decrease uh, the rates of the stock exchange, or those who all of a sudden decide to invest or divest, etc. So the, nowadays, there is a very serious shift of the weight of decision making from the democratically elected instruments, such as the democratically elected governments, to an oligarchy that makes a total of decisions as 
all the power and is at the same time invisible, which means that this neoliberal growth and neoliberal development of this aggressive, hectic um, development aimed at an authoritarian and oligarchic governance of the planet. And this is uh, democracy given in. And this is the shifting of um, uh, the power to a non, an uncontrolled uh, oligarchy. And this is, uh, I think, uh, one of the most significant consequences uh, of this globalization. I think that um, uh, all uh, aspects are equally uh, significant because we have ecological impact, uh, social impact. Uh, people have uh, seen their lives uh, and aspirations and uh, dreams crushed. So what should we do? We find out that the key for the uh, economic, uh, social and democratic Europe today lies in the growth model, the growth paradigm. What needs to be done? There are two views, there are two schools of thought. One according to which we need to go on with the same development model, uh, trying to achieve the integration of Europe, uh, changing things, but also at the same time preserving the nucleus of the economic stability uh, there. And there is also the other view, the other school of thought that says that in the name of uh, the poor, a turn towards uh, the far right um, is necessary. We are threatened by the immigrants, uh, by the illegal immigrants as they uh, call them. We are threatened by anything that is uh, not uh, like us. That by anything that is divergent, nor uh, should the return to the past of introversion of nationalism and of national capitalism, such as the one proposed by Trump and Le Pen nowadays, can be a solution. Nor can we claim that we need to abolish and uh, do away with uh, globalization nowadays. These are not solutions. Uh, this is uh, uh, very well uh, put by Etienne Balibar uh, in his book, um, Europe Crisis. And, and it is not up to the discretion of the European people so to um, opt off uh, globalization, opt out of globalization. Uh, globalization is a Catholic uh, and global phenomenon, not only economic one, but also political and cultural, is a non-reversible process because it is not an institutional construct, but rather a new stage in the history of mankind, which means that um, the deglobalization is most probably a wrong proposal, as was impossible for us uh, to reverse the progress uh, that was uh, seen uh, with the use of uh, electric power or with uh, the airport, the airplanes or the train. We couldn't reverse the changes that were brought by uh, the movies, um, the cinema, the TV, etc. We cannot claim that we will put an end to globalization, um, uh, that we will uh, stop this flow of uh, globalization. So what should uh, our steps, um, our future steps be? Currently, the narrative uh, of uh, the conservative and neoliberal uh, forces in uh, Europe as well as in Greece is that um, uh, against uh, this um, uh, neoliberalism, we have a left uh, populism uh, um, downgrading the contribution of uh, the progressive thought and uh, moving uh, the field of confrontation more to the right, uh, center left, since social democracy, unfortunately, um, is looking uh, towards the neoliberalism. So on the one hand, we have populism, a progressive populism, and on the other hand, we have a uh, conflict between the neoliberals and the far right. 
And uh, this is a field which is obviously privileged for the neoliberal because it shifts to the uh, right uh, the whole uh, um, operation. And uh, as against the far right, the neoliberals appear to be progressive. Of course, uh, we have seen uh, different things in Austria. We can see that um, uh, when um, center uh, right uh, wants to form a government, they can very easily do so and cooperate with the far right. So, what are the ideas in Europe that uh, can bring uh, forward a change? What are the ideas that can reverse today's uh, situation? An aggressive economic model that has uh, brought forward um, financial disparities, that has uh, destroyed the balance, has destroyed institutions and democracy, and has caused a huge deficit, democratic deficit, definitely has to be opposed against a model of a growth having um, agreed that growth and development is the key to change. So it has to be replaced by a model of a fair growth, fair development. And let me explain what I mean by that. I am talking about uh, development and growth that will be addressed to everyone, a growth and development that will provide equal access to all to its goods. It won't be addressed to the few. It, to, in order to achieve this, we need to have a sustainable growth, a growth that can be afforded by the system and the environment. It has to be a lower intensity growth, a lower profitability growth, but such a growth that will guarantee social progress. It will be able to guarantee social solidarity, a kind of growth that will be compatible with the environmental reserves, it will be compatible with the climate, the whole planet, and also a development that will be a guarantee for democracy in the institutions. How can this be achieved? Um, this whole concept of sustainability and sustainable growth is a whole concept of moderation as it has been introduced in ancient Greece. We're not talking about mediocrity, but rather moderation, a balance uh, stricken. So uh, sustainable growth is uh, this growth that that uh, places emphasis not only on economic fr profitability of those who exercise this activity, but also the social benefit, uh, the social welfare, as well as the ecologic sustainability and feasibility. So we're talking about a low intensity growth. We're talking about low profitability, lower rate, lower pace. But it is yet, it is a growth. Uh, it's uh, addressed to the people, to society. It is balanced. It is uh, environmental friendly. And it does not um, lead to the destruction of the reserves. And I want to be crystal clear. It's not out of um, uh, empathy to the environment and to nature, etc. That this too would be an adequate argument um, for, us, um, for us. However, in this uh, discussion uh, we are holding here today, the, uh, the fact is that um, uh, ecological reserves are uh, responsible for uh, the growth potential. If we have the sea, we have the soil, if we have the natural, natural resources, we will be able to have growth. Thus, ecology, um, in the case of sustainable growth, becomes a factor, an element of uh, um, growth. Uh, we are not ecologically sensitive. This is not the way we think. Um, we don't need to go back to a model where we will uh, live without um, using the natural resources. We're not talking about that. This was an extre extreme ecological position according to which we shouldn't do anything uh, where there 
there was nature. We wouldn't intervene. So we are talking about the need of ecological feasibility. We need to see, since we have come to a point where we need to draw a line vis-a-vis -vis the exhaustion of the reserves, if we want to have growth, we need to have the environment. We need to have the natural resources. Thus, the case for society and ecology in the whole affair of sustainable growth and development go hand in hand. Even more so when we talk about green growth. This is an evolution of sustainable growth. It does something more than that. It puts uh, uh, limits uh, to sustainable growth. It says I will grow up to the extent of uh, the bearing capacity of the system, be it the social system or the bearing capacity of the ecological system. So sustainable growth is a growth that has to obey to certain uh, conditions, certain terms. What we want to have is a growth that will uh, have um, ecological activities that will not leave a footprint, uh, that will be harmful for the environment, that will not exhaust ecological reserves. So this is one step further. This is a great challenge for um, mankind's intelligence. If we're able to grasp this opportunity and proceed to, to a kind of uh, uh, growth uh, that will put a break in front of the uh, lines that are limits and will not further uh, lead to uh, environmental deterioration. And let me move on to the subjects pertaining to democracy. Why? is sustainable and fair growth a guarantee to democracy. This return back to moderation uh, between society, economy, and environment restores social justice, restores ecological justice, and um, mostly it allows uh, the entire population uh, to uh, have a saying in the growth because uh, a growth uh, that will be fair and will be all inclusive will not um, uh, allow only a few to um, tinkle with the uh, growth. There won't be only a few who will uh, have uh, developing projects uh, where we will be working. This sustainable growth uh, allows uh, the entire society to take part in this process because we go from the uh, profit-making growth to a uh, socially fair and environmentally friendly growth. And this is really important for the discourse that's being held nowadays vis-a-vis -vis the um, differences between uh, the public and uh, the private sector. Uh, the conservatives say that the public sector is corrupt, etc. And on the other hand, we say that uh, the private sector is corrupt. Now, if the subject of economy is not isolated private uh, individuals, but rather social groups such uh, in accordance with the sustainable growth principles, then we are not uh, addressing ourselves uh, to individual rights and interests, but uh, to collective interests. And this is the fair idea. We are not uh, directing this growth uh, to private uh, individuals, but rather to social groups, because the, what is at stake here is to uh, distribute evenly the wealth uh, to society in order to uh, ensure social solidarity, social welfare, as well as ecological balance. So in fair growth, and this is an important characteristic. We don't have uh, private behaviors nor private factors. Thus, we have no concentration of wealth. There is no 
uh, democratic deficit. So the cards are uh, uh, shuffled, and everyone gets to uh, play in uh, equal terms. So we have uh, democratically elected uh, instruments, um, we have governments, the European Commission, etc. Thus, the market as we know it to date will reacquire the old message of Agora, where uh, we had a place where uh, the demos would meet, where the many people would meet. Uh, the market, as we know it, is a recent construct. But Agora in uh, ancient Greece was a place where people would gather, would discuss, and through the uh, discussion, they would reach uh, some uh, decisions. And this is what Agora is all about. And let us not forget that the freedom that was uh, proposed uh, by the uh, economic neoliberalism was not addressed to man. It was a freedom that pertains to the market. So the use of uh, the term freedom uh, does not um, exempt us uh, from uh, the right uh, to talk about the freedom of individuals, because capitalism appealed to the freedom of markets, uh, for the uh, traffic of goods, of trade, uh, etc. So the market uh, is, uh, acquires uh, its old concept, and democracy, which means the state of the many, gains new meaning because the uh, economic growth is dispersed, is disseminated to the demos, to the society. I will conclude. Yes, I will conclude. Thank you very much, Alfonso. So, yes, I'm done. So the progressive response to the atrocity of the uncontrollable uh, uh, system and to the unfairness that is uh, Produ produced by the markets uh, cannot be but uh, a political one, and it can and it can not but focus on a model that uh, uh, will talk about the fair growth that will help us guarantee more democracy. And allow me a personal uh, remark here. The fact that uh, the concept of the market, uh, of uh, the agora, and of democracy. Uh, have been born here. The fact that Greece became a test bed for the most devastating austerity policy that ever existed in the past few years in Europe. The fact that uh, we had the first progressive change uh, in uh, Greece in 2015, uh, whereby we had uh, a party of the left um, around which we had um, several other uh, powers managed to uh, win the elections and now they are in government. They are the uh, government that will take us um, away from the memoranda. And fourthly, uh, the fact that Alexis Tsipras, who had been a candidate in uh, the European elections, in the past elections, means that maybe all this is not the end, but rather the beginning of uh, a new, sustainable, fair, democratic Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Milopoulos. We have approximately 10 minutes and no more than 10 minutes to entertain some comments and questions, if there are any. You have the floor. If there's anyone among you who'd like to make a comment, ask something or add something, feel free to take the floor. The gentleman over there, could you please come here? And whoever else wishes to take the floor, please come forward so as to use the microphone and be given the floor fast. I have uh, given the, the floor to, to the gentleman coming. He raised his hand first. I'm sorry, he was the first to raise his hand. I saw him first, that's why I gave him the floor first as the moderator. Well, this is a question generally addressed to the conference. 
but please be succinct and brief so that we can entertain more comments. First of all, I'd like to clarify that in my opinion, a progressive person is a person that understands that people's rights identify with uh, the right to human evolution, being part of nature, not being a plan of a conqueror. From the old times to today's businessmen using the mentality of mobsters, uh, using the, the force of the few progressive people of every era fought battles, peaceful or not, that shaped today's uh, opinions and ideas about human rights. They won a lot of battles, but they kept losing wars and the final regulations of uh, human life were uh, made by those that consider people to be disposable. Wars were always lost because of the human deficit of progressive people because there was a fragmentation of forces not joined and there was a confusion of the final target as against the solid position of the systemic opponents who know when to join forces and when to agree on something if it is to serve of their voracious interests. So since the efforts of progressive uh, forces up until today failed in agreeing on a model that is needed for a final victory, what is the model that the people that inspired this initiative have thought of in order to convince uh, people that consumption, uh, bliss, uh, evanescent as it is, is trivial compared to prosperity in a steady and healthy environment, uh, which is something that guarantees uh, uh, long-term survival. Because when people uh, are self-complacent and when they are not convinced, there is going to be a debacle because the earth is not enough to accommodate all of us. Seven billion people and uh, uh, 303 trillion uh, trillions of uh, wealth on a global and European level. Thank you very much. If there is anyone else who would like to say something, please come. I'll ask a question that I asked yesterday. Yes, but all of you, please be kind enough to be brief. I asked the question yesterday, but I think it was not fully answered as it should have been answered, says the speaker. There is a production matrix either from the left or from the social democracy. Um, background that produces authoritarian uh, regimes. For example, social democracy produced Mussolini and Hitler. The left, it is precisely as I say, says the speaker, uh, the left produced uh, Stalin and the Red Khmers. You're saying that this is not precisely the point, says the speaker. How can we tackle this if we do not have a system of constant openness of democracy going up to direct democracy, bottom up? Is there a proposal of this kind? Wealth redistribution. Do we have a proposition for a system of uh, automatic redistribution? I heard the comrade who put forward a proposal. But this particular proposal, again, leads to one leader. One leader, one party that will govern concentrating economy, not decentralizing economy. How is it that at the moment we can uh, tackle what he mentioned, that is global concentration of capital? How can we manage this? Do we have a system of automatic redistribution through the procedures and processes of production? And do we have institutions that will reverse the concentration of system and decentralize it? Can we have a bottom-up growth? with interactions, bottom up, bottom down, if you wish, bidirectional, so that we don't have the concentration of capital in the hands of very few. Even this system of fair growth and everything done in moderation cannot do something if a group, if, uh, for example, um, a joint venture of uh, people that come up uh, with something very good, they keep producing. 
For example, an association of 10, 20, 30 uh, people, social enterprise, that is, will have uh, capital concentrated. How do we tackle that? That is, once we had concentration and accumulation of capital, concentration of powers and not decentralization, without a system, simply by changing institutions constantly, wherever we find a problem, we tackle it. Please. Um, wind it up, says the moderator, to allow for more speakers to speak. If there is no other question, we'll stop here. Okay, very brief after the, the speaker. I am professor of clinical uh, psychology in Slavonsk. Uh, I'll talk about um, people's uh, resilience mental resilience and psychological resilience. After all these blows and after the recession and the crisis and taking globalization for granted, how is it that people's frustration can be overcome given the measures taken all over the world, especially in the United States of America, where the biggest industry at the moment is the industry of uh, medicaments and uh, drugs for mental illnesses, especially among the adolescents. According to DSM-5, that is the clinical uh, manual, if you wish, that we use in order to measure a person's normal behavior or behaviors that go against the system are regarded as opposing ones or oppositionist behaviors. And in the latest textbook of the American Psychiatric Association, they consider this to be a psychopathological problem that is treatable with the use of drugs. Therefore, I'm merely broaching the question, how is it that these new forces, as they were eloquently presented here by Mr. Milopoulos and all the previous speakers, the lady from Belgium, given that I have also studied this as a speaker, and I know, uh, how is it that we can examine this within the framework of our own perspective? That is a progressive perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, Mr. Trigazis. There is a microphone. Thank you very much. No, it's better to stand here, dear Mr. Vitalis. I would like us all to share a certain concern. Since we are talking about ideas, what are the ideas that can be set in motion so that we can actually change Europe? Isn't this the gist of the discussion, dear Professor? So is it perhaps? that the title of this two-day meeting, joining forces uh, for another Europe, should be producing new ideas for a new Europe. Because without ideas, not much can happen. You heard it repeated that ideas, a great theoretician had said, that ideas, a great theorist had said that uh, ideas gain material force and power when they conquer the masses. So could we perhaps put forward in view of the Euro elections of 2019 uh, should be what are the new ideas that can mobilize societies? Which are the ones that can actually inspire young people? For instance, we in Syriza in international relations I'm merely mentioning this example, and I'll finish, said the speaker. We uh, accommodate groups of students from universities of Europe. This week, the week ending uh, today, we uh, accommodated and welcomed 250 people, five schools from Denmark and the University of Geneva, 250 students. And they asked me, what is the reason why Greece entered this profound state of crisis? And the answer I gave them was the following. You must have read about corruption and so on and so forth, I suppose, but I'll only put forward one. 
reason, which stands, in my opinion. Greece, and now I'm coming to what Mr. Melopoulos said, Greece has been characterized as the Saudi Arabia of renewable energy sources. I'm talking about students, 17, 18 year old students. I said, do you know guys that Sweden produces more solar energy than Greece? What else am I to say? What else can I use as an explanation to justify the crisis and recession in Greece? Thank you very much. Thank you for abiding by the time limit, says a moderator. A lady, let's conclude with a lady. Good morning, my name is Arabi Karaman Lee. I would like to make a brief reference to something just because the previous comrade that asked a question here made mention um, to social enterprises. Here in Greece, we have an innovation for social e uh, economy which introduces the salary convergence one, two, three, and social profitability, and it deters entirely private concentration of capital because it only allows money to be paid as a salary. That is, something is produced by the social enterprise and is paid as a salary in 65% concerns social profitability. Um, so, it would be well advised to use something which has been established, and this particular government established it. We are looking for the subject that will serve this purpose. However, for all intents and purposes, the first efforts, I think, constitute a positive step to the direction. Well, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone who took part in this discussion. Mr. Kostas Vuzinas, Mr. Walter Bayer, Mr. Vertran Horvat, Mrs. Ariane Fontenelle, and Mr. Yanis Melopoulos. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the comments made. Would the speakers perhaps like to make comments? Uh, no, there is no time. Uh, there is no time. We have already exceeded the time limit. Thank you very much.